Hello and welcome to today's WIM I Am Power Digitalization Trend Creating Opportunities in FMB. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Jashida Kamal to kickstart this webinar. Jashida Kamal has over 20 years of experience in wealth management. She is well versed in managing multiple asset classes such as equity, bonds, foreign currency, and gold, to name a few. She is also the board of director of Women of Global Change Kuala Lumpur, which is a network of business leaders and entrepreneurs working towards building businesses as well as making social impact globally. The floor is all yours, Jashida. Thank you, Ina. Welcome, everyone. Hope uh, all of you are in good health and staying safe and healthy in whichever part of the world you are currently at right now. Welcome to Digitalization Trend, Creating Opportunities in FMB. My name is Jashida Kamal, and I stand for women stepping up and to be financially independent and ultimately achieve financial freedom. Um, it is my honor to be moderator for today's session, and I am super excited because we have three absolutely amazing panel of speakers with us today. Um, let me start by introducing our first speaker. He is a um, seasoned entrepreneur and also a startup enthusiast, Mr. Sayan Tandas, um, Managing Director of Food Panda Malaysia. Um, followed by our second speaker, he is also a seasoned entrepreneur and um, experienced. Mr. Stefan, Stefan <laughs> Francis, co-founder and uh, CEO of My Grocer Malaysia. Last but not least is Mr. Brian Liu, a well-known and uh, award-winning entrepreneur and also the CEO of Tea Life Asia Malaysia. Welcome, guys. Um, okay, so one of the impacts of the lockdown during this pandemic is that most of us work from home. And because of that, this has caused a massive shift in consumer behaviors, including the way we buy food and also uh, grocery shopping. There's this huge shift in towards going online, um, online uh, shopping, grocery shopping, online food, and because of this, it's very important for all players in the FMB uh, industry, whether you are a food producer or manufacturer or restaurant owners, to go digital. Because not only can you increase your customer base and revenue streams, um, it's also important for you to stay afloat. And, and that is the whole uh, reason for this topic today. Um, I would like to start with um, all the speakers and maybe Mr. Saintan, um, if you'd like to answer the first question, which is, in what ways has the pandemic changed the consumer behavior in the online food purchasing and how has this impacted your business? Thanks so much, Shashira, and good morning to everyone. What an honor it is to be here um, and um, wishing everyone a happy Ramadan. Hope everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy wherever you are uh, across the world. Um, and um, very interesting uh, question, Jashida. So um, I think maybe just uh, backtracking a little bit uh, and uh, taking a step back and looking at how uh, COVID-19 and this whole global pandemic has evolved and how it has actually impacted our business. Um, I'd just like to point towards a few key trends um, that we saw, in fact, developing before COVID-19, in fact, even started. Um, and what we saw is actually there was a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of evolution in terms of consumer buying patterns, not only in Malaysia but across Southeast Asia as well. Um, we still have a huge population over here in Malaysia that is somewhat unbanked, undigitized in the sense that they don't have access to internet or smartphone. Um, only 84 or 85 percent of the population in Malaysia actually has access to broadband internet. Um, around the same amount or the same percentage as access to smartphones. Um, and so we actually see that the digitization trends um, were beginning long before COVID even started in terms of growth um, of acceptance of digital methods of purchasing, um, so on and so forth. In countries like Indonesia, for example, Facebook is the internet. Um, and so in those kind of markets, um, you actually see that, um, you know, they bypass or consumers over there bypass um, certain, uh, certain channels just to get 
uh, or consume whatever data or content they need. Um, and this can all be aggregated within a single app like Facebook. And so Food Panda exists to kind of sort of emulate that sort of behavior where we want to exist as a single app to be able to provide consumers with a choice to not only buy food, but buy um, other items as well. And recently we diversified into groceries and other sort of consumable goods. But in terms of business impact, what we see is COVID has actually proven to be an accelerant when it comes to adoption of digital technologies. Um, and this was already the trend, but now what we see is there's a steeper gradient in terms of adoption rates, um, whether it's new customers or even active users or returning customers um, purchasing more frequently. So definitely on the consumer behavior side, um, a lot of customers are purchasing more frequently online and they're proving to be sticky customers. Um, convenience and quick delivery is actually top, and top of mind. Um, when we look at across, across our exit polls, this is, these are the two things that customers point to, convenience and fast delivery. Um, when it comes to what they want to see of a, related to a platform or correlated to a platform such as Food Panda. And this behavior has just gotten more pronounced in the sense that more and more consumers want their meals, want their items delivered in 30 minutes or less. If you just go back two years ago, consumers would have been happy to get their items to them in less than 60 minutes, let's say. But now it's gradually going down to 45 minutes, to 30 minutes, to 25 minutes. And eventually, I'm pretty sure it will kind of go down to 20 minutes and 15 minutes. Um, so that's another behavioral trend that we see has shifted quite a bit. Um, and thirdly as well, I think from a whole macroeconomic perspective, I think um, it was even beyond our wildest imagination to understand how we would be playing such a pivotal, pivotal role uh, in an economy. But in all the markets that we operate in, um, we see that we are able to provide livelihoods, meaningful incomes as a result of our space within the gig economy. Um, and so a lot of those people who have unfortunately been negatively impacted as a result of COVID by losing lively, their livelihoods, their incomes, they actually now can supplement or even complement their incomes by joining platforms such as Food Panda um, to ensure that there's no loss in, in financial freedom, as you put it. Um, and what we see across the fleet is we see a lot of uh, actually women riders, um, and I'm very proud to say that they now form a good uh, chunk of the fleet that we have um, delivering food and, and other such items all across Malaysia. I think you might be on mute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Santan. Oh, wonderful. I love, I love uh, knowing that women, there are more women riders. I'm in the women empowering, empowerment space, and, and that's really great news. Um, I, yes, I totally agree. As, as a consumer of Food Panda myself, um, I totally agree that convenient and fast delivery is definitely um, crucial. And it's really amazing because I order my food and then I go and shower and then I finish showering and my food is there. I mean, how, how awesome is that? <laughs> okay, so uh, what about Stefan? Um, can you shed some light on that? So thank you so much for having us here this, this morning. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to always join these sort of panels and, and to sit with people like Sai and Brian who have built amazing businesses. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of fun and we learn from them as well. But my process started on the back of a very simple desire. Uh, I run busy days and, and the idea was, why do I have to take so much time going down to the store and buying groceries and coming back when I should be able to just get it delivered like everywhere else in the world? And we took that idea and we extrapolated it further. We said, well, we deserve high quality ingredients, high quality food. Uh, as a nation, we are very, very, uh, dare I say, obsessed about food, right? It's the one thing that binds us together as a nation. But when you go from store to store, and this could be the same brand store, the experience you have is very different. Uh, freshness, pricing, availability. These are all things that as consumers, we're dealing with on a regular basis. And, and we felt that there could be a better way to do it. We should focus on convenience. So you should be able to get what you want when you want it every day of the year. It should be fresh. It should be as fresh, if not fresher than if you went to the store and got it yourself. And, and I'll come back to that a little later. And finally, it should be affordable because what we found is that in many places you could get things delivered, but the cost of delivery was ridiculous. Uh, I, I had one seafood provider I used to buy from and amazing seafood, nothing wrong with it, but it will cost me 40 ringgit in delivery, right? And yes, if you're buying 200 ringgit of seafood, some people say, well, 40 ringgit is fine. I don't think so. And so we started from that idea and ultimately needed to also be an app that anyone could use. We wanted it to be used by people who were familiar with technology and people that were not. 
And, and that's where my grocer came from. And so we've, we've been taking this journey and we started it out right as the pandemic hit. Uh, and, and that taught us a lot of things. So we've seen consumers over the past 12, 18 months change their behavior a little bit. Uh, adoption of technology, as I said, has increased exponentially and that has presented its own learnings and opportunities to us. Uh, we've seen consumers being willing to give us feedback on what is expected and convenience, rightly so, is one of the biggest things that they want. Uh, they want to have it delivered in a way that is predictable. So you can't tell them that you're going to deliver it at a certain time and then you show up five hours later. It doesn't work that way. Uh, freshness, very, very important. So for instance, anything that you buy on my grocer it comes with a freshness guarantee. And that has been a huge support of the other trend, which is consumers are looking for trust. Uh, speed is important. Availability of product is important, but they have to trust that the product they get is of the highest quality possible. Otherwise, they don't want it. And that's the other trend. Consumers have been going online looking for trusted partners, not just whether you can buy the product. Uh, this extends into how they pay for the product. Is it safe to pay on the platform that you're on? And that's been a, a huge challenge educating people. But we're very fortunate that we work with amazing financial partners who actually help us with that. And so consumers have become more sticky with us. They're coming and they're spending more as they build that trust. And they're experiencing the freshness levels that they haven't seen before. And this makes it something that they like. So convenience, freshness, value for what they do and predictability in what they do. These are the main trends that we are seeing from our side of things. Thank you, Stefan. Um, that, that's really awesome because um, I, I get really irritated when I go out and buy grocery shopping. And you know, with there's so many people and, and I'm, I'm rushing and I'm wearing the mask. And, and I don't know, sometimes I, I don't have time to make sure that the food is fresh, right? I just buy them, quickly buy them, I go home, and then when I want to cook, I'm like, oh, man, you know? So I, I love this, that, that, that you guys, my grocery guarantee freshness. And I also have this mentality that fresh means expensive, right? I, I used to have that mentality as well, like, oh, my God, no, if I want fresh, then I have to pay a lot. And, and it's really amazing that it, it's good to know that it's affordable. So it is, and, and, and that extends into the delivery as well. So we keep the delivery prices controlled. So it's a fixed delivery cost wherever we deliver. And that's important. So you know what you're going to pay. And also it's in terms of, um, I'll, I'll do the simple one, the ice cream test, right? So when you buy ice cream by yourself and you take it home, it's already started to melt. Whereas uh, when we deliver it to you, it should be just still frozen. And that's how we measure it. It should be as if you took it and you rushed it home in 20 minutes. And that's how it works. Yeah, I mean, that's really an amazing consumer experience because mm. uh, I think moving forward, uh, people should start to change their mindset to buy fresh food. And, and yes, I, I have my share of melted ice cream as well because, you know, I have kids and, and they're like, no, oh, mommy. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> this is really, really good. Um, okay, so, and, and what about you, Brian? Um, how has this pandemic changed your business? And do you see any change in consumer, consumer behavior for tea life? Yeah, so... Um... So I think COVID has um, obviously um, impacted our business at the beginning um, during the early time of um, COVID um, lockdown period. But I think we continue our growth um, into our store account expansion and we react also very smoothly to the pandemic. And um, I think our observation tells us that, you know, um, the revenue per store was impacted a bit, but we have since then recovered about 90% um, of what we did pre-COVID. And I think what one of the significant is um, we realized that certain store format in suburban rural area as well as our petrol station format has been performing really, really well during the COVID level. So it has been performed very well compared to our pre-COVID level. But the most impacted will be um, shopping mall area in market center and um, airport new city outlets, uh, which have taken a bigger hit on, on the footfall. So I think what we observe is in the market, um, urban areas seems to be a bit more um, suffering in terms of um, 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 inconsistent foot traffic and all this. But I think what we also learned that, you know, um, suburban and rural area has been a big, um, has been a big um, advantage to close up the gaps for us when we have a drop in the urban area. So I think the learning is um, um, we, we managed to cruise through the pandemic is because um, our store format are very diverse, um, very diverse in terms of geographical and format. So we can see our store format in petrol station, in shopping mall, shop lot, all the way to a smaller town. And then the smaller town has been performing really, really well during the pandemic period. 
And I think we also see that there was a switch of um, channel and um, consumer buying behavior. So pre-COVID level, um, delivery was just um, 5 to 8% of our total system-wide sales. But today, um, delivery has been as much as um, 30% of our total sales. At one point of time, during lockdown, MCO1, MCO2, right? Um, the delivery business has all the way went up to 45%. So I think the switch of channel has been very important. So we just, as a retailer, we got to be make sure that, you know, um, we, our customer able to access to us, whether they take away at store level or whether they, can, they could order um, us easily um, when they're staying at home. So I think that's what we observe in the market. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's really wonderful to hear news that, you know, this FMB businesses are thriving, thriving during the pandemic. MCO 1.0, 2.0, I don't know if there's going to be a 3.0. I'm like, really hope there isn't any. Um, and uh, it's great that you shift channels of distribution and make it accessible to consumers. Um, Again, when it comes to food, it's always about accessibility and convenient um, because, hey, nation, we love food, right? So if you, the, the more you make it easy for us to have it, whether it's tea or food or chicken or whatever, and we will definitely consume it. Okay, so um, our next question will be, what are the key segments that people look out for in order to take advantage of the global online food industry? Um, can we start with Stefan, please? Well, that, that's actually uh, something that we spend a lot of time looking at every single day. Uh, and, and the place that we spend most of our energy on is actually hyper-local product selection. So we currently offer something in the range of seventeen to 18,000 different products on my grocer uh, as, as a totality, right? And this is after our first year. And we keep about... 9,000 of that active on a daily basis. So that changes based on what's going on. Whether it's, so for instance, now it's Ramadan and heading towards your Raya. That product mix changes a little bit. But on top of that, in addition to working with the brands you love, FMCG brands, global brands, local brands, all those things that you kind of expect to see in the supermarket, we then said, what more could we do to make that experience better? And that product mix started with things like, uh, could we get ready to eat food? And that was very important, right? Now it's Ramadan everyone's busy, would you like some satay, for instance, delivered to your house? And so you can pre-order that in the morning with my grocer and we send it to your house and it's ready to go. And that was an extension of our products because we already had that capability where we have the fresh meat and we can marinate it or we can work with partners who already can do that. Uh, if you like kueh, we get it made fresh on a daily basis. Uh, next week, we actually coming up with our Hari Raya collection. Then you're going to get rendang and you're going to get ketupat. Because a lot of people now, especially, they don't have the time to make these things, but they want that taste. It brings out that, that joy of going to the store. It brings that in-store experience to your home. And so we started looking at that. Then we also looked at the kind of products you're looking at. So Malaysia being a multicultural country, uh, you can't say, and, and I'm going to take uh, a simple example, chicken, right? We all eat a lot of chicken. A lot of people go, oh, you know, you're going to buy chicken. You go to the store and you buy chicken. What you don't realize is that there's at least seven different kinds of chicken that you need to meet the different kinds of people that we have. And, and this is a cultural thing. It's, a, it's a, where you live. It's the kind of price you want to pay. It's whether it's organic or not organic. And, and seven is just the starting point, right? Uh, we have halal, we have non-halal, and, and so these things, right? And so when we start to look at that, we have to source the right products, offer it in the right quantities, make sure that it's available in a variety of options, and then we have the joy of figuring out how to deliver all of that in a way that keeps that product in the best shape that we can. Now, that product mix is where we start. Now, consumers look at that variety. Then we have to make sure that the pricing is right. So it's great that you have high-quality products, as you said, Jashida. But can we also make sure that it's not priced so high that you can't afford it? So, for instance, uh, just yesterday, I think, or was it earlier, earlier last week? Uh, we started offering this, this range of organic beef products. And people said that it's going to be three or four times the price of normal beef. But we figured out a way where we can actually get it where the price is negligible, the difference, right? Uh, if you want the product and you want high quality organic beef, this is where you can get it. Uh, or if you want organic vegetables, we've got it directly from source that we can attest to. So we've seen the certs, we've checked the farms. Uh, if someone says that a product is of a certain quality, we need to see that quality. 
uh, in many cases, we test the products ourselves. Our ready to cook meal kits, for instance. Uh, it's a funny story, but every meal kit we, we sell has actually been cooked in my co-founder's uh, kitchen personally before we sell it. Uh, we eat a lot, obviously. It's a perk of the job. But everything that we sell has been eaten by someone uh, on the team. Every product we sell has been used by someone on the team. And that gives us a measure of confidence that at least we know what we're selling. And we're trying our best to make sure that we keep doing this on an ongoing basis, right? And this extends right down to pet food. So people who have cats try out our pet food uh, and, and so on. And, and it gets to be a very interesting uh, situation where we're constantly looking at how do we make sure we offer convenience, yes, freshness, but the product quality is very important as well. And, and that's where that conversation starts for us. Excellent, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, what about Saintan? What is the key segment? Yeah, um, great question. And uh, I mean, really interesting insights from Stefan. Um, and I mean, I would love to see or understand the trade secrets behind the, you know, the organic beef uh, recipe that he has cultivated. Uh, but um, I think uh, when I look at learnings uh, and insights that Food Panda has generated, actually what we see is um, an increase or an uptrend in terms of the different choices of food that Malaysian and in fact um, other people across Southeast Asia would want to experiment with. Um, and uh, this is quite interesting because pre-COVID we saw that uh, you know, a lot of our consumers were um, trusting of only the big brands. Um, so whether it's the like of Tea Life um, that Brian has successfully uh, now grown or whether it's the like of other major household names such as KFC, Pizza Hut, Domino's, whatever else it is, um, we saw actually a lot of um, a lot of, I wouldn't say saturation, but a lot of kind of interest and volumes um, just generated across those segments. Um, but with the, um, with the introduction of the pandemic, of course, um, and with, the, with COVID-19 um, touching everyone almost all over the world, um, you know, what we saw was actually there was um, this sort of behavior called impulse or revenge spending. Um, and that's quite interesting because um, when people are stuck at home, generally they have more disposable income to spend on uh, online channels. Um, and so when you look at kind of online channels versus offline channels, you see, of course, that availability on online channels may be or may be perceived as being lesser than what you would find offline. So let's say, for example, if you go to a mall, you might feel like you have an abundance um, of, of choices. Um, you can go to a mall like Mid Valley in KL, for those of you who are from KL or familiar with KL, or go to a mall like Pavilion, and you would feel like you're overwhelmed sometimes because of the choices that you have. I'm sure Brian's wife would be in uh, fairy tale land going into some of these malls, um, and I'm sure that's uh, true of a lot of other people in this call. But, um, you know, what we see online or before, um, before the pandemic hit, what we saw online was that people actually didn't have access to those choices, even though we had thousands and thousands of brands available. Um, we saw that maybe the discovery experience needed to be improved because when you go outside to a mall, you're actually kind of engaging either window shopping or you're looking at browsing through different items. So then kind of mirroring that experience online onto Food Panda is what we kind of engage ourselves in. Um, and so when, we, when the COVID-19 um, pandemic hit, we saw that there was a lot of interest from, let's say, um, lesser known brands. I mean, even mom and pop shops. SMEs, MSMEs looking to go online and breaking that digital divide, breaking down that digital barrier. Um, and Malaysians responded actually very enthusiastically. And so what we saw is volumes were actually distributed um, even more evenly. Um, of course, through the likes of, um, you know, Tea Live, KFC Pizza, those brands still generated significant amount of interest. But it was also quite well distributed um, across your mom and pop shores, your local um, burger stall, your local satay stall, your local chicken rice shop whatever else it is, um, you know, Malaysians wanted to kind of um, engage more um, with whatever was hyper-local for them. Um, and that's actually a very positive trend that we saw. Of course, the Malaysian government also stepped in to kind of incentivize um, growth and volumes across some of these mom and pop shops. But as a result, um, when we first started or when the pandemic first started, we kind of anticipated 30 to 35 percent of all F&B outlets to shut down, which is a huge number just in Malaysia alone. Um, but actually, that was kind of um, that was kind of negated um, because of Malaysians wanting to support um, basically the local brands that existed across their neighborhoods. Um, and on from the business side as well, I think Brian touched upon this a little bit earlier, which is quite important. But from the business side, what we see is actually a, many more 
business owners, F&B owners are getting more savvy, getting more sophisticated, and they're looking at smaller format stores so that they don't have to spend much into CapEx, into capital investments, into building up the store. And uh, as a function of that, you don't have to spend much on labor because you have a smaller size to fit in your labor. Um, and a lot of now FNB uh, owners, FNB entrepreneurs, let's say foodpreneurs, as I call them, they're looking at how they can pivot um, and reimagine fundamentally what an offline store should look like. Um, and where back in the day, you would have maybe 20 to 30% of that space used for online deliveries. Now you have 60 to 70% of that space catered just fundamentally for online deliveries with 20 to 30% looking at the offline space. But we understand that when the COVID pandemic is behind us, um, you know, we need to still drive footfall uh, offline. And that's why we have a few tailor-made products to kind of get customers back into the stores. Um, and with the relaxing of the lockdowns and stuff like that, um, I think there's a, many more customers that are venturing out to experience this. Um, and we want to kind of push through and pass on the revenue or the monetary benefits that we have through some of these products back to the FNB, um, the FNB owners and the entrepreneurs. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the key trends that we've seen develop across uh, across these segments. Thank you, Sayantan. Um, Brian, as an outlet owner, uh, is there any key segments that, that you look out for, that people need to look out for should they want to go global? No, I'm just trying to anchor what, what Sai said, right? Um, he mentioned about, you know, reimagining the store format and how did the offline retailer um, got a piece of um, delivery business going forward, right? So I think what, what have we saw the change in our store format over the past um, one over years is because our store format has now become bigger. Instead of smaller, it become bigger. And the kitchen has now turned bigger is because uh, we have started to launch a lot of um, virtual brand. So initially, our, 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 our kitchen just catered for TF operation, right? Today, our, all our future store, we actually double up the kitchen size because uh, we want to prep for a future where we could accommodate a lot more different virtual brands. For instance, we could start offering fruit juice, we could start offering yogurt, um, um, coffee, um, all different range of um, beverages operating in the same kitchen. So I think what we did um, at the beginning of our um, COVID period is we, we launched a very billion model, uh, a virtual coffee brand, uh, which is Bassware Coffee. Bassware Coffee today is the largest virtual coffee brand in Malaysia, we, which we have about 130 outlets virtual footprint that integrate directly into TF network store, store uh, uh, in the network. So out of these 130 outlets of TF operations, actually there was a hidden virtual coffee brand called Basketball Coffee operating off the similar assets. So from there, we can actually um, mill our assets to make sure that our assets actually work harder. Instead of just paying same brand to do one thing, but today our stock format is operating out of many things but paying the same brand, using the same manpower as well. So I think from there, we realized that virtual brand has been a, a true answer to the compression of margin going forward, to the you know to to the to the answer of our uncertainty of food traffic. So because virtual brand can now be operating off the online platform, it gives us a lot more room to look at better margin. How do we um, leverage on our existing resources and make sure that we work harder on that? And from there, we realize that you know virtual model is really the answer for future going forward. Thank you, Sorry. Brian. Um, no problem. This is, this is something new, virtual brand. I've never heard of this. Does that mean that the virtual coffee is not, that it's not available? Uh, so, in so in a simple expansion, right? Today, when you walk across, across t Life store, you don't see Bass Bear Coffee logo or signages at the t Life store. But that brand is actually operating off the similar kitchen inside t Life store. Mm. So which means that if you're a customer, you walk into t Life store, uh, we did not sell Bass Bear over the counter. We only operate... Bus bed through the similar kitchen, but operating 100% powered by delivery company. Wow. Wow, that, that, that's innovative. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I, I hope that, that, that these amazing insights shared by the speakers um, can help uh, you boost your business and, and help you go on your digitalization journey. So moving on, um, so the question that I would like to ask is that post-pandemic, how do you ensure consumers' demand will still grow? Because everyone will be out and about, and, and you mentioned about revenge spending, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to stay at home. So how do you make sure that the, the, the demand will still grow? Um, can we start with, with Sayantan, please? Sure, thanks. Um, and very relevant question. Actually, 
we already see kind of trends evolving, um, mirroring what you, the observation that you just shared, uh, Jashida, with um, kind of COVID lockdowns relaxing, uh, many more people are uh, heading out. Um, so there's a lot of outbound traffic, uh, especially in areas such as malls uh, and other sort of public spaces. Also, I think uh, across uh, major F&B outlets, there's uh, you know, an multiply effect in terms of um, footfall. Um, uh, but I think uh, when we look at trends, actually, and we're um, a heavy data-driven company over here at Food Panda, and when we look at trends, we see that the customers that we acquire onto the platform, they're actually uh, quite sticky customers. And what does that mean? It means that they actually order frequently online, um, and they don't mind actually kind of, um, kind of donating or uh, earmarking a significant portion of their wallet, what we claim as wallet share. Um, for purchases on Food Panda. Um, one thing that we've also kind of um, engaged ourselves in and looked at how we could diversify is by offering more complementary goods, adjacent products. Um, of course, food is always going to be in our core. Um, that's basically what our DNA is built upon. Uh, but this is why we've kind of very aggressively um, tried to diversify ourselves to uh, get more and more products, more and more variable products delivered across the last mile. And this count, this could be things such as toothpaste, things such as toothbrushes, pet food, whatever it is. Um, we've kind of now um, launched a new vertical called Shops um, where customers can actually engage and buy things that you would normally get from the likes of a 7-Eleven, a Guardian, a Watson's, a supermarket. Um, and you could then get that delivered uh, by using Food Panda. So that's uh, you know one thing that we feel would be very, very positive um, in terms of a positive contributor in terms of ensuring that people stick online. And actually that's proven to um, provide us with very, even though it's still quite nascent, we've only been in this space for around a year a bit. Um, we still see very, very positive customer behavior trends evolving and developing across that space. Um, I think the second point is something that I touched upon earlier is how do we kind of connect the entire ecosystem? So what we look at over here is um, how do we embed ourselves within a customer's daily life, within a customer's every day? Um, and so food is just probably maybe 30 to 40% of what you do every day. Um, you know, buying groceries and stuff like that is probably 20%, um, 10 to 20% of what you do every day. Um, and the other 30 to 40%, let's say, um, is spent at home, maybe cleaning up, doing dishes, cooking. Um, our biggest competitors are not actually other platforms out there. Our biggest competitors are people who cook at home. Um, and that's something that we want to disrupt. We want to kind of pivot behavior away from that. And so that's really where the strategy now lies in terms of how can we get more people to depend on us um, because of the convenience that we drive, because of the speed that we drive to ensure that they remain loyal customers. And what we see is we need to connect the offline to online space uh, more deeper. Um, and so that's why we have a lot of channels now, a lot of products to incentivize spending offline in terms of going to the outlets that we've partnered with, going to the brands that we've partnered with, whether it's dining in or taking away as well as connecting that back to delivery, um, regardless of whether it's for food products or other products. Um, so that's how we feel um, the trends will revolve. And very, very uh, initially, I mean, as we kind of may hopefully are hitting the tail end of um, the pandemic, um, we see these behaviors are here to stay. And so it's very, very positive for us. Thank you, Santa. And I, I do agree on customer stickiness um, is that, you know, during the pandemic, we're kind of used to ordering food online. And even though we still go out, I mean, I personally still order my food online, even though I've been out and about um, because th there's, a, there's already a mindset shift. Right. So we already like, oh, OK, I'll just go and press a button and order something. Uh, so yes, I, I do agree. Um, stickiness and and also um, so what what uh, Food Panda has has done or is going to do is going to expand expand your product range, right? So that you can meet variety needs. Okay, yeah. Okay. Awesome. And uh, what about you, Stefan? Um, as an online grocery shopping, how do you maintain stickiness? Well, first of all, let me just say that uh, Scienton's efforts at making his app sticky. Uh, have personally caused me problems when it comes to my diet, since it's very easy to just go on there and look, oh, look, let's eat that, and you press it, right? And it arrives. So uh, well done on that side. Uh, but I would say that the points raised were, were actually entirely relevant to us. With us uh, from today and moving forward, uh, we are of the opinion that the pandemic is going to last for a period of time. It's not going away anytime soon. And it's the first of many things that will change consumer behavior in the years to come, right? Uh, we now have a generation 
of people who have experienced a different way of doing things. And some of them have become enamored. They, they become habitual when it comes to that. Uh, we also have people who generally did not want to go to stores to start with, right? And now they've been told that they don't actually have to. And so they may not return to the stores. So my grocer was never built to replace traditional uh, offerings like supermarkets or hypermarkets and things like that. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of going to supermarkets. I've got a few that I like. I take my son with me. We have a good day of it. But I don't want to do it every single week. And carrying 40, 50 kgs of things back home, not really a fan of that. Driving through traffic, not really a fan of that. Uh, and now I'm not a fan of huge crowds of people touching the food that I'm going to eat. Really not a fan of that. Right? So the experience of going to a store, I think, is going to evolve. And stores that will survive and thrive are those that actually adapt. If they insist on just being a place where you go to buy things, I think they're going to have challenges. But brands like my grocer appeal to people who are looking for certain things. So if you're looking for freshness, convenience, value, definitely. We, we offer these things. And we have people who come to us because they appreciate that. They also appreciate the affordability of what we do. So they understand that when we say that you can buy every day, they don't have to wait for us to go on sale because our pricing is designed to be everyday prices. Our sale prices are actually sale prices. So there's a segment of consumers who are doing their research and saying, okay, this is great. There's a segment of consumers out there, uh, and this is currently as well as post-pandemic, who just don't want to go to grocery stores anymore. Uh, the experience is not what they're looking for. To them, it's a utility, it's a chore. And services like us offer a solution to that. So they can sit at home and they can order their fresh food, fresh fruits, which is things that people come to us for specifically because we can handle the fresh, which is something that not a lot of online brands can do. Uh, they also come to us because of the variety of things we offer in terms of something as simple as uh, snack food. So they want to get their snacks delivered. They want to plan their purchases 14 days in advance. We allow them to do that. So you can book delivery slots 14 days in advance and forget about it. And then it just arrives when you said that it's going to arrive. And we don't charge you extra for that, which is also something that people like. They also have people who are coming to us because they say, hey, great, you know, I go to the grocery store and I buy certain things, but I want to buy certain things that could be bought from you because I don't need to touch it myself. Now, uh, we have what we call the auntie test. Uh, you know, I sit with, with aunties, uh, my aunties or other people's aunties, and I go, tell me why you're buying from me, tell me why you're not buying from me. And some of them go, well, you know what, no matter what you do, I'm never going to buy fish from you. And I go, okay, let's talk about that. And they go, I have, to, I have to touch the fish and I have to look it in the eye, and then I know whether it's fresh. And I go, okay, you know what, I'm not going to argue with you about this, but we offer chilled fish, we offer clean frozen fish, and we take it from the pot, we take it from suppliers, we know it's fresh. But what about your chicken? And they go, what do you mean? And I go, well, do you need to touch your chicken? They go, no, we, we trust the chicken. We go, great, you're going to buy that from me then. And I say, and, and you buy uh, milk in these one liter boxes? They go, yeah. And I go, well, you know, look, you're 60 years old. You shouldn't be carrying 10 kilos of milk. How about my boys carry it for you? And they go, oh, okay, fantastic. And uh, then we go, and we also have all these products like marinated meats. We have, uh, we recently had an entrepreneur join us. So we, we encourage entrepreneurs to actually join us as well, uh, home-based entrepreneurs, and, and a fair number of them are women, actually. And they come to us and they say, hey, you know, I'm making products. Can I sell it on your platform? And what we say is, well, we have a set of standards, guidelines that we need you to meet. But if you do, we'll put you online. And recently we had a kombucha, and it's, it's a thing, right? People want kombucha right now. And so uh, this is... Uh, entrepreneur, she, she came to us and she said, I have this amazing product. We tested it, we tried it, we go, okay, great. It tastes nice, let's do it. We put it online and people bought it. But that was something that people discovered because our product discovery allowed them to try it and they liked it and now it's selling. Right? Uh, we put out different marinated meats and people say, well, this is not something that I can get in a traditional store. It's not something that I can do at home. But the price difference on buying the meat and buying the marinated meat is so small that maybe I try it and now I can try the same type of meat. I can try it in four different flavors. We go, yes, you can. And so they do that. Or they come along and they go, well, how about you tell me what I should pair with my products? So product discovery, the experience of the food is what we focus on. And that's going to make it more and more amenable for people to come to us as well. The other thing that happens is uh, people want to be delighted, right? So going to a store is fantastic. 
But the stores you remember are the ones where you have great memories. It could be the, the person tending to you had a great attitude or the person who presented the product to you gave you a great experience. And that's what we're trying to recreate as well. This extends from the way that apps work on our mobile app and our web. It extends to the way it's delivered to you. And it extends, very importantly, to customer service. So our customer service is designed in such a way that they're empowered to fix questions and problems that come in to us. Now, we maintain a hotline seven days a week. We have Facebook Messenger, we have WhatsApp, and we have email. And we make sure we're accessible because if there's a problem, we want you to come to us so that we can fix it. If the product's not fresh, and it happens despite our best efforts, if a product is not fresh, we refund you or we replace the product. No questions asked, right? You just need to see the product and make sure it's not fresh. Uh, if you have a question about your product, we'll try and help you. Now, during the pandemic, we saw certain patterns happen. Uh, people who had never cooked before started cooking. And we had one memorable experience where, and I'm just going to take a quick minute on this. Uh, someone wrote in to us and said, we want to complain because your chicken was not fresh. After I cooked it, it's bleeding all over my plate. And we said, well, that doesn't sound right. Let's get on the phone and talk to them. And it turned out that this was a young person who had taken a frozen chicken, heated a pot of oil, and put the whole frozen chicken into it in an attempt to fry it. So they hadn't cut it out. They hadn't thought the chicken. Uh, we gave her a chicken simply because it was funny to us. And, and you know, she, she gave us a good laugh. It was a, it was a busy day. So we gave her a chicken anyway, and we taught them how to do it, which is why now certain products come with cooking instructions. <laughs> we send uh, ready-to-cook meal kits. So if you're someone who doesn't cook regularly, this is another important trend. You don't want to go down to the grocery store and buy a whole chicken and a whole bag of rice and all the other things you want to do just to cook a dish because your parents are coming home. You want to impress them. Or you want to have a date night and you want to impress someone special. Or your boss is coming over and you want to, you want to show them that you know what you're doing. So we might sell you a meal kit. Six persons can eat chicken, lentils, and rice. And what you do is you get a box. In the box is the ingredients just to make that dish and the instructions on how to do it as well. Now you look like a pro. You have zero wastage because we're big on that as well. And you've impressed people. And the price to do that is about the same as the ingredients because we don't put a surcharge on top of that. It's ridiculous. And people like that as well. So post-pandemic, we think people are going to keep coming to us for the experience, for the convenience, for the freshness, for the value. And because we, we sort of give them something to talk about. If it's just going to be a delivery service of groceries, that's not going to work. That's what, the, that's what we think, right? But if we provide value into people's lives, that's where it becomes something interesting. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I think that if you want to have the food experience, you can do auntie test, uncle test, brother test, whatever you want. Auntie test, you can call me. I, can, <laughs> I volunteer to give you a food experience uh, feedback. And, and, and Brian, and I, I, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, I assume that uh, for tea life, post-pandemic, you will not have any issue um, getting a consumer to, to grow their demand, right? Is that right to say? Um, I think as I um, shared just now, right, the, the diversity in, in terms of geographical and model uh, um, keep us um, sustainable during the pandemic and post-pandemic as well. So I think um, this is what we observe, right? So when every time when the more traffic we use, um, but it doesn't show on the number, it's just switch of channel. So which means that the, mom, the number will flow through into delivery um, to cushion up some of the, 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 the incon inconsistency of the output traffic around. So I think that, that's what we observed um, in the market. Every time when there, when there was a launch of lockdown, um, there was a massive shift from um, consumer buying behavior. So which means that people now travel less to a congested area, um, um, and then, but they will switch it, their demand to, to delivery. So I think we, we see that as a post-pandemic um, 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 behavior. Um, Given the fact that you know um, um, the traffic in the mall would not change, you know the traffic in the mall would not be the same anymore post pandemic. So I think this is what we always believe. Uh, being an offline retailer, we gotta acknowledge um, the fact that you know the traffic will never be the same anymore post pandemic. And the only way for us is to make sure that you know um, how do we tap into all different kind of um, buying behavior and different kind of um, customer base. It's just so that you know we need to make sure that um, we are all across from digital online and offline as well. So people could access to us um, whenever and whichever they like. 
So I think that, that is the key bit of what we look at um, post-pandemic trend. And I think there's also a big learning for us being an offline retailer is we have never um, imagined that we will change to become today a FMCG players or even an e-commerce players. So I think what we did um, during the early lockdown period is we launched um, a boba ice cream in the partnership with Walls Ice Cream. Today, the ice cream has been the number two most sellable ice cream in the SKU in 7-Eleven. So we never imagined that being an offline retailer, we would have an opportunity to stretch our leg all the way into FMCG industry. So I think that has been proven. And then we realized that, you know, we, we wanted to be all, we want to be basically all, all over the place. We want to make sure that we are a retailer, we are FMCG player, we are e-commerce player as well. So I think what, prior to that success, we also launched the world first um, boba instant noodle in partnership with Mami. So I think, I think that's the last thing that people will imagine how would the boba appeal in instant noodle, right? So I think that has turned out to be a great success. Um, FMCG pivot for us as well, followed by our ice cream. And then from there, we also launched our TLA Mart, uh, TLA Online Mart, which means that we're going to feature everything has got to do with bubble tea on our TLA Online Mart. So people can now access and buy um, bubble tea ingredients. People can now access to buy bubble tea merchants. We just launched uh, last today a boba, sorry, bubble tea board game for people who stay at home looking for something exciting to play with. So we just launched a boba board game um, for, for the kids to play at home. So I think that, that has really um, given us opportunity to reimagine how bubble tea is going to be like the post-pandemic period. So I think that, that's the answer to it is, is continue pivot, continue innovate. Um, we never stagnant in the way that we always feel that bubble tea was just a form of drinks. Bubble tea can be an instant noodle, bubble tea can be ice cream, bubble tea can be a board game, bubble tea can be an online market. So I think that's what we learned throughout the period. Wow, thank you. That's really awesome sharing. All right, so um, the final question is, uh, what are the food technology trends and tools entrepreneurs can use to kickstart their digital business? Uh, this time, can we start with Brian? Um, I will um, Sorry, just you know, I lost your question. Sure. What are the food technology trends and tools that entrepreneur can use to kickstart their digital business? So I think um, for, for the last three years, I think um, some of the breakthrough initiatives that we did, um, including some of the breakthrough innovation that we did um, back of house, is we invented the KDS system. KDS system is a kitchen display system um, that facilitates our training process. So today we got about 3,500 um, 3, 3, staff uh, where we train them through KDS system that help us to shorten our training period, which we needed. Usually, previous day, we need a, a good one month to train up a professional barista. Today, we only need 10 days. So what did the KDS system do, right? So the KDS system basically omit all the SOP. Um, 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 our staff today doesn't need to remember any SOP of the drinks. Just imagine when you look at the menu, we got about up to 70 old drinks. 70 old drinks, you know, um, people ask for less sugar, more ice, more toppings, right? That equals to 200 old SOP in the list. So people say, when we train the profile bar side, it took one month, well, one month to, for them to really get hold of the, the technique and to remember all the SOP. Today, we omit off the part where they need to remember SOP. So we created the KDS system. KDS system actually facilitated on 2019, which we expanded 200 hours in a year. So I think without KDS system, we could not imagine that we can push all the way for massive expansion um, at the current rate. So KDS system is definitely one of the innovation that we did. Uh, we have an internal BI tools, we, which we use to look at a day-to-day -day business heartbeat um, that we're able to look at our EBITDA level of business uh, at a real-time basis. So I think we never actually imagined that, you know, we, we were one day able to look at the EBITDA level at the real-time basis, which means that at 4 o'clock, we can look at our EBITDA level on store-by-store -store basis at 4 o'clock. At, 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 so, you know, it's completely time-based. So I think that that's how shift um, and how prompt and responsive the business has been um, after adopting some of the technology that we did for this. Oh, that's really amazing. Um, Stefan, um, any insights on food technology trends and tools for entrepreneurs? With us, we, we kind of started out as a, as a tech company, we were a pure tech company. So we started building some of the tools right at the beginning. Through the pandemic, however, we had to rebuild many of the things that we're doing just to meet the, the changes that were coming in. 
Uh, part of that was how we actually track food in our systems. So right now it's still a combination of offline and online. We're, we're very old school in some ways. We haven't built all the tools we need, but we can actually do just in time delivery of food. So our vegetables and our meats tend to be delivered daily and that keeps the freshness levels very, very high. But that means that we need to be able to predict the amount that we need to make sure that we don't run out. And we built the tools to do that. We also needed to be able to track delivery. So when a product is picked and it's packed and when it's delivered, can we do it within a certain number of hours? And that's important because if you miss that deadline, your vegetables are fresh or your ice cream has melted. And that's entirely on us because then we have to resend it, which is an extra cost. And we also have to replace the product and that's an extra cost. And that's a total loss to us then. Uh, more importantly, it's an unhappy customer. Uh, we are very fortunate that right now, the majority of our customers are very forgiving. So when there are problems, they bring in, uh, they go like, hey, you know what? I got two bags of beans and one of them is super fresh and the other one, I don't quite like the color. Now, it's interesting because that color, it's fresh products, right? It may not be that it's not fresh, but the perception is there. And even in cases like that, we try our best to try and address that. So we might send a new bag over or we might speak to them and see, hey, can you cut that open and tell us what happens? And, and that's important because it's allowed us to build trust with customers. Uh, last week, and this, this was something we were very pleased about. Last week, a customer wrote in and they said something we sent them was not fresh. And we looked at the picture and our customer service shop said, hey, you know what? Looking at the picture, I, I think it may not be fresh as it should be. I'm going to give you a refund. Two hours later, that same customer called in again and go, hey, you know what? I actually cut it open. It's super fresh. It's just that it didn't look as fresh. Uh, take the refund back. Now, that was something that we were waiting for. Customers to actually build that trust, not just to say that I trust you to buy your product. I trust that you're going to do the, the replacements, but to actually respect the brand enough and to treat us as a, as a partner and say, if something is working, I'm going to come back and tell you about it as well. And so we're very pleased when these sort of things happen. Um, that's because we can track our customers. So when you call into us, we know who you are. We know what you've done. We know your buying history. We know your patterns. Uh, we also build tools so that the financial data, when you shop with us, is entirely secure. So when you do a refund with my grocer, we actually, actually have to ask you for your uh, credit card details again because we, we keep the highest levels of security that we can on financial data to make sure that you can shop safely. You don't have to worry about whether your credit card data is going to leak, right? Uh, and this is partly why it's been a bit of a delay for us to roll out new ways to pay. I'm happy to say we're rolling that out now and you'll get additional ways to do it as well. In terms of tracking a delivery. So if you call into the site and say, I'm supposed to get a delivery between one and three o'clock, what time is it going to arrive? We can give you an estimate on that. And we're getting better and better at that. That technology is being built. Uh, we're also working with independent entrepreneurs now. So we're building tools and that's rolling out this year where we'll help them to actually work with us more effectively. Right? We're also working with partners and empowering them to offer micros on their platforms. And those are new tools that we're building as well. And finally, we're looking at new uh, formats, if you will, so that people right now can access micros services through their mobile phones and online. But later this year, we're looking at ways where they can access what we offer in new ways. And that tools are being built right now as well. So it's a combination of functional things that we already have, making it better, faster, smoother, uh, prettier. Right? Pretty is very important to us as well uh, and more secure, but also making it available in new ways, helping our people get trained on it, uh, building our own POS uh, solution as well. So there are amazing POS systems out there, but we wanted something that would allow us to integrate into our backend inventory systems so that we speed it up, we track it down, and we can do refunds, for instance. So if you order 20 products, 19 are available, right now we can do a refund to you within a day. Can we do that faster? Can we do it quicker? Can we do it more effectively? That's what we're looking for as well. So those are the things that we're building right now. Okay, thank you, Stefan. And uh, Sayantan, are there any existing tools that entrepreneur can use uh, without having to build? Is there anything existing right now in the market that they can use to boost their digital business? Sure. Um, again, very relevant question. And of course, what we've seen across the pandemic is um, very positively and very encouragingly so that there has been kind of a renaissance in terms of entrepreneurship uh, and also a lot of kind of 
startups now um, coming uh, and also becoming more uh, embedded within uh, the entire space, right? Um, re regardless of whether it's in Malaysia, Southeast Asia, or in fact in the States. In fact, I was reading a report the other day and late stage startup funding has actually been, uh, has actually kind of exponentiated in terms of growth. So I think there's now even more money available um, from the likes of VC funds, angel investors, private equity funds to pump into the ecosystem. And that can only mean well um, for startups and entrepreneurs who can break down kind of um, problems, who can solve real core big problem statements, come up with solutions to that, um, and then of course evolve the business. Um, but maybe taking a step back, let's say it really depends on which stage of the startup lifecycle you're in, in terms of how you would want to look at your product or look at your service or look at your business. Um, but one thing I always kind of, um, you know, try, try to caution entrepreneurs against is basically spending money stupidly, quote unquote, uh, because, you know, what, the moment that uh, entrepreneurs raise uh, funds or the moment they, they have a little bit of liquidity, maybe a lot of them um, fall into this trap of thinking that they need to spend heavily in terms of acquiring customers. Um, where there is some truth in that, it's not all true. Um, you want to acquire the right kind of customers. Um, and so when I kind of said earlier on in the call that Facebook is the internet in Indonesia, um, you know, you kind of need to break this down and, and look at how it relates to your business. Because if as an entrepreneur, you suddenly go ahead and spend marketing dollars on Facebook, um, you, and, and you kind of do that blindly without a strategy, your ROI is definitely not going to be anywhere near what your expectations are. And then it kind of has knock-on cyclical effects in terms of the business model that you have, which can lead to failure, right? Um, so I think one thing is always try to understand what the business model is, where are you going to make the revenues, what the revenue model of your business is, and try to break that down. And you should have kind of a best case scenario and a worst case scenario model um, if you're a young stage entrepreneur. I mean, even today at Food Panda, we actually build that as well. Um, so it's really focusing on the basics to understand you know, what is the worst case scenario? How much margin of safety do we have to play around with? And what is the best case scenario? And then that forms basically the genesis or the evolution of future business plans that we create um, month to month. The second thing is, I think with kind of work from home becoming more and more semi-permanent, um, you know, there's a lot of collaborative tools. I mean, for example, we're having this, um, this webinar on Zoom. I think back in the day, we would probably have it in kind of a physical environment. But there's still what we see a lot of entrepreneurs, um, regardless of what product they're um, kind of getting their feet dirty with or feet wet with, they're still a bit resistant to use kind of online platforms or collaborative tools. Um, you know, Zoom is, of course, now a buzzword, but there's a lot of other things. There's kind of Google Sheets. There's a tool called Asana that we use to share tasks um, and distribute that across the team. Um, these things can actually reduce time. And as a startup, as an entrepreneur, you're always focused on speed of execution because there's always probably five to 10 to 100 other people who have the same idea. But, you know, the winning formula is how fast can you execute? Your product doesn't need to be 100% perfect. It can even be 70% perfect because the main thing is you can iterate and you remain agile. But speed of execution is really, really key. Um, and then the third thing that I would point towards is basically ensuring that you have a really great team. I think one thing is, um, you know, Food Panda has kind of garnered on leverage of a lot of success um, across the pandemic is because, um, you know, we have a great team in place and we still kept on hiring um, and we still kept on onboarding remotely employees, interns, part-timers who joined us across the entire um, COVID pandemic. Uh, and even now, we're still engaging in kind of remote interviews, remote onboarding. Um, but, you know, we still kept the momentum and we ensured that we got the right people. Um, and so one thing you need to be very, very aware of and self-aware of is what are your weaknesses? Where do you need people to complement you? What kind of team you want to build so that it's future-proof, right? Um, and I think as Stefan pointed out, you know, the, I think this kind of COVID-19 pandemic is a scratch on the surface in terms of what we should be expecting. I think Bill Gates said that there's just a super flu around the corner that we still don't have a vaccine against. And so potentially in five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, we might have a pandemic that lasts three, four years um, without an end in sight, right? So I think all these kind of learnings, all these kind of new ways of doing business is something that we should internalize um, and we should kind of make it permanent. For example, I mean, we're probably not even opening up the office um, for the next 12 months. We're giving employees the option to work remotely, um, stay at home and work. Um, and that's probably going to be the case for the next 12 months at least. Um, and so these kind of new ways of doing business, new ways of doing work um, are here to stay. So we probably should embrace them um, quicker rather than later.
Thank you so much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to the Q&A now. Um, I'm actually looking at a question by Isaac Liu, and this question is to Brian. Do you think the COVID-19 will permanently change the way of people shopping in malls for FMB? If so, what is your opinion for people who want to start FMB business in malls? Is it a good time to enter the FMB market, especially setting up in the malls? Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so I think it's just purely my, my own, own observation, right? Um, so what, what we believe, post-pandemic, the traffic footfall around the mall would never be the same anymore. I think people have started to adopt on, on, on digital um, buying behavior. So people start shopping for clothing on online. People start buying food from a daily platform and all this. I think that will be a long-term um, uh, culture to be stayed. So I think this is what we look at, you know, um, when we map out our expansion going forward, right, we actually um, reduce some of our expansion towards the mall, but double down our expansion across all the shop lot formats, across suburban and rural area. Because we feel that, you know, um, um, post-pandemic period, the only thing that will never um, will, will stay will be um, the, the demand for, for on-demand, um, the demand for, for quick accessibility of products, convenient and uh, good quality of products uh, in affordable price. So I think those are the new culture that we see going forward. Um, mall has no longer been very competitive because somehow if, if I could agree, um, if I could agree to my statement, right, somehow um, delivery company has got a, a algorithm that doesn't really favor the mall because of, our, of the delivery duration that it took. And then somehow it, it really pivoted all the orders to, to shop lot format rather than the malls. So that also giving us a great answer that, you know, um, if we put up our store in the mall, we, we likely lose out our traction when it comes to dealing with um, delivery or algorithm. So I think our malls compared, um, the, sorry, the delivery orders compared to mall format and shop lot format, shop lot format tends to be double up. So I think this is what we see going forward, um, where the rider could easily access to order, they could pick up the order wherever they are, rather than they have to park their, 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 their vehicle at, at some designated location in the mall and run all the way to your store and pick up the food and, and deliver to the customer. So the convenience is not there, the, the duration is long, and, and that's what we foresee going forward. Um, it's going to be less competitive in the mall. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, and the next question is by Elizabeth McAllister. I, I assume this is for uh, Stefan. We see many grocery retailers shifting to online platform and home delivery method. This has created a stiff competition among the industry players. How do you make my grocery different from the rest? How do you plan to ensure because consumers choose you and not Tesco or Grab, for example? That, that's actually a question that keeps me up at night uh, quite a bit. Thank you for that as well. But the, the simple answer is, uh, I know it's going to sound odd, but we don't actually spend a lot of time thinking about how we're going to beat our competitors. Uh, we think that there's tremendous opportunity in the market. And even if every online store today was to grow by five times, the demand is still greater than that. And, and we think it's fantastic that there are so many people out there trying to make things better for consumers and trying to improve the way that we buy the food that we like. What we do, however, is we spend a lot of time talking to our customers. Uh, we spend a lot of time building information databases as customers ourselves. And we look at how can we replicate the best parts of the offline store experience? Things like having range, things like having product discovery, things like making it fun to do your grocery shopping. How do we replicate that? We then look at how we can improve that. Can we make it safer? So for instance, uh, some stores touch your food a lot, right? It arrives, it gets touched, it gets handled a lot. How do we reduce the handling of fresh items? And with us, for instance, it, it's quite simple. It comes direct from the source. It goes straight into a temperature controlled environment. It only comes back out when, when it's being packed for delivery. The only time we might actually handle it is if, for instance, you say, can I have the chicken cut into 16 pieces? Then you get a butcher who takes that meat out in an air conditioned area they cut it, they wrap it back, and then they put it in a bag and it gets sent out. And that's still in a box that is temperature controlled as well. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we look at food integrity, food safety. We then look at food sourcing. 
and we look at the freshness items. We look at the price of products, and, and this is something we do look at competitors for. And we say, well, are we pricing it right? Are we pricing it too high? Uh, we don't worry about pricing too low. Look, we can get a product and, and we make a margin that's fair to our thinking, and it's still priced lower than our competitors. We're still going to go ahead and do it because we've already decided what our margin is going to be. We don't determine our pricing based on, can we make more money because everyone else is doing it? And that's part of, of who my grocer is as well. And ultimately, we think that that's where it's going to come from. So customers, uh, consumers, and this is both consumers and businesses who come to us as well, they come to us for a couple of things. They say you're more convenient to shop with, you're more predictable, your freshness is of a higher quality, and when it's not, you very quickly fix it because look, things go wrong from time to time. I, I would say that we have a 95% success rate without issues. The balance 5%, sometimes you have some issues. And of that 5%, maybe half again is stuff that we actually need to go in and fix. We make no excuses in those. We go in, we fix it, we learn from it. And every day we're learning something and we improve that process. So when we first started, I can tell you, in the first week we did this, we lost 60,000 ringgit uh, because we made a mistake on the orders. We couldn't predict the amount of something and, and that was wastage. Today, we have less than 3% wastage across the entire operation. And that is mostly off guts. You know, for instance, when you buy a cabbage, the outer layer might not so pretty and we have to take it off. It's still viable, but customers don't like it. So sometimes you take it off, but then we take that and we try and use it for something else. So it's, it's a lot of different things going on. And that focus on making sure that the quality is there, making sure that the customer is looked after, that's what makes sure that customers come back to us. Now, if a customer could come to us and say, well, you know, out of the 20 items that I buy, that one product, the other store is selling it cheaper. What are you going to do about it? Uh, our answer is going to be, well, look, we've done the best that we can. And if you think that that's the best way for you to go, uh, perhaps you should buy that product over there. But if you're going to drive five kilometers to buy a can of something because it's 50 cents cheaper, uh, my question to you is going to be, how much did you spend on fuel, on parking, and on the time that you lost? Whereas if you buy consistently from my grocer over a period of time, and, and I know this because I'm a customer myself, uh, you see a 10 to 15% reduction on your grocery spending. And this is a, a totality, right? It's the cost of delivery, it's the, which is your parking and your driving. It's the amount of time that you save. And it's just the stress. I can do my weekly grocery shop right now in 10 minutes at two o'clock in the morning on any day of the week and plan my shopping. Now that is invaluable to me because my time is the most important thing to me right now. And I can do it in a way that's predictable. And I can still find amazing products that I can't find. Uh, December last year, we actually did an import from the UK of chocolates, sweets, and snacks that people really wanted. And we brought in, well, we brought in enough that we thought would be enough, but some of the stuff ran out really fast. But people liked that because it's stuff they couldn't find. It's brands that people who had studied overseas looked at and they go, wow, that's amazing. And people also who had never tried it looked at them and went, well, let me try this because it's priced in a way that I can get it as well. So these are the reasons that people are going to come to us. Are they going to go to other brands? Yes. Some brands, however, tend to go with the, I want the maximum number of customers and I'm going to give them the lowest prices. But that's their way of doing things. With us, we make sure the prices are fair. The products are consistent. The experience is something that is predictable and we try and delight our customers. Every brand is going to have a way of doing these things and we encourage customers to try different brands because we found that when they do, the great majority of them come back to us because we offer them a superior experience. And, and we're very proud of that and we, we work very hard to make that better every day. Thank you, Stefan. I think you probably have converted some of the audience here. <laughs> I, I hope so. Or some remarks. <laughs> okay, and the next question is by Aisha, and it, this is for Sayantan. What are the hygiene guidance for food delivery that Food Panda has imposed to ensure the food safety, especially to avoid cross contamination? Thanks. Uh, great question. Um, and so one uh, unique factor um, for Food Panda in Malaysia actually is that we operate two separate fleets. Uh, and they're divided by uh, halal and non-halal products. So actually, um, we have riders that are just specifically designated and dedicated to deliver halal products, uh, and that's across one individual fleet. And we have riders that are designated and dedicated to deliver non-halal certified products. 
and that's uh, you know in a, a separate fleet. Um, and so through this, of course, we ensure that there's no uh, risk or there's no chance of cross contamination at all. Um, and of course, we are sensitive towards the customs, towards the traditions, um, and uh, towards the beliefs of uh, individuals within the fleet. Um, and so we wanted to kind of create this ecosystem, this atmosphere to ensure um, that everyone's needs um, and, and customs are being taken care of. Um, of course, um, down the stream, when the food is being prepared, when the products are being prepared, we rely upon our partners to ensure that they're packaged well, to ensure that there's no possible risk of cross-contamination as well when the food is in transit. And this is really the responsibility of partners that we, um, that we engage with. We have best practices in the sense that with partners, we always provide them with, SO, with tips, with advice, with guidance in terms of how to package their food or how to package their items. Um, and let's say, for example, if you know, burgers are being uh, ordered, you know, they should not be packaged um, in the same compartment as, let's say, cold drinks, because that would make the burgers soggy. Um, same with fries, you know, it would kind of deteriorate the quality of food uh, much quicker. Um, and these are things that we pass on to our partners, which they take on board. Um, and so that also ensures that the quality of food um, is, as, um, is as the best possible it can be. Um, and so we don't want to kind of degrade customer experience when the food reaches you. We, we envision um, a kind of um, experience where when you actually bite into that food or when you actually consume that item or product, it's almost the same as when you would do it in, let's say, uh, when you're going to dine in or when you're going to shop yourself um, in a physical outlet. Um, so those are kind of the, uh, the, the methods that we look at um, in terms of safeguarding, you know, cross safeguarding ourselves against um, risk of cross contamination um, and all other such um, risk factors. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much for your invaluable insights and knowledge. And I'm I'm very sure that our audience today part, uh, benefited so much from this. Um, my name is Jashida Kamal, and I would like to wish all of you good luck on your digital journey and business ventures and back to you Ina. Thank you all. Thank you all. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's session. Now, we truly hope that you have gained valuable input and this will be beneficial to you. Now, thank you everybody for being here today and making this webinar successful. Now, please spare some time to complete the survey form we've prepared for you at the end of the session. Please also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube for regular news and happenings. Now, on behalf of WIEF Foundation, thank you for joining us today and have a great day ahead. <laughs>